Okay. Um, you're all most welcome. Uh, my name is Catherine Cronin, and I'm speaking to you from the National Forum Office in Dublin. Uh, and my co-moderator in the webinar here is Leo Farrell. And we are delighted to be joined by our guest speaker today, Jenren Wetzler, who is the Assistant Director of Open Education at Creative Commons. Hello. And in today's webinar, Jenren will, uh, will deliver the first part of the webinar, which is really just an introduction to OER and open licensing, and specifically how to use Creative Commons licenses to do that. And I'll follow up with some specific um, details about OER to support teaching and learning and how the National Forum uh, is, is supporting that. And as you can see from our title slide, back here, uh, this presentation itself is an OER, so you can see the CC BY license in the lower right hand corner. Um, and we'll talk more about the details of that license and other licenses um, during the webinar. Uh, we have a doc set up, which those of you who have arrived early um, hopefully have found your way to, a document that has the link to the slides um, and also a place that we can collect questions uh, during the webinar that we can leave plenty of time to answer um, at the end. Um, I will thank the people who, um, who went ahead and added some questions to, to that document before the webinar took place. Um, the very first question that was posted there was about what open means, particularly in terms of access and equity. And um, this is a very important question. So I want to say to preface the webinar entirely that this is really designed for beginners to open educational resources um, and open licensing. And I know that some of you are here in the webinar um, have some experience, so some of what we say will be uh, familiar to you. But we know from our discussions across the sector and from wider research that um, this kind of foundational understanding is, um, is what's important um, for most people. So that's what this is geared at, is just people um, just being introduced to the whole notion of OER and open licensing. Um, the simplest definition uh, in terms of resources, at least, is that open means not just that the resource is free, um, but that it also comes with a set of permissions about how you can use that resource. And Jen will talk about that in a lot more detail. Um, but it's definitely not straightforward. There are, there are certainly a lot of complexities, and hopefully we can get into that um, in the discussion um, at the end. So um, before I introduce um, Jen Rin and her presentation, I would just like to say a few words about the National Forum and um, our mission in support, in terms of supporting open education. So the National Forum is a national body, for the sake of those of you who might be from outside Ireland, national body that supports um, collaboration and enhancement of teaching and learning in higher education in Ireland. And two months ago, um, as a preface to some of our activities this year in terms of open education, uh, we published this forum, Insight, um, which is just a short document which explains really why we are supporting open education in Ireland. So a key objective of the National Forum since 2013 has been to build digital capacity and capabilities um, to enhance teaching and learning. And within this, um, developing and implementing open education principles and practices that are aligned with EU policy and emerging international practice is part of our mission. Um, so this webinar is really um, in line with that. And if you'd like to find out more about what the National Forum is doing in terms of open education, there's a short URL on the screen there where you can find this particular forum insight and the resources that we're creating. And I just tagged on there also some of the, um, some of the hashtags that we use when we share information on Twitter. Uh, a couple of people were asking me about these. So there's a series of NF hashtags that we use around which are really national forum initiatives. So NF Digital is anything that goes out in the national forum space around digital. And then DIG, H-E-I-E, -E, um, is being used um, broadly by anyone who wants to share anything around digital um, initiatives and teaching and learning, particularly in higher education in Ireland. And a year ago at the EdTech conference, we launched this kind of open education in Ireland um, community of practice. So if you want to share anything about open education and higher education in Ireland, um, you can just tag it with the open ed IE hashtag um, and other people will find it. Um, and in terms of uh, welcomes, before I introduce Jenren, I just want to say that um, I want to give a special welcome to, um, we have a number of audiences, a special welcome to project teams who are working on teaching and learning enhancement projects, um, which, are, which have National Forum funding. Because as you know, all of the work of the National Forum that we do and that is done through our projects is shared openly. Um, and we know that some of our partners in those projects need support for how to do that. So this webinar is really designed specifically for those projects. But we also know that people are joining us from um, higher education institutions, from further education, 
from secondary, from business, you know, all over Ireland and beyond Ireland. So I just want to say, I, I know there are a lot of audiences here in the webinar and we want to welcome you all. So with that, uh, I would like to give a very special welcome to Jenrin Wetzler, who is the Assistant Director of Creative Commons. Jenrin works closely with Stephen Green, with some of, who some of you may know um, in Creative Commons. And Jenrin has accepted our invitation to join us today to go into a little bit more depth about Creative Commons itself um, and how Creative Commons licenses can be used to create OER um, and support teaching and learning. So thanks very much, Jenrin. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so just bear with me for one second. I'm going to share my screen, which is um, just a continuation of our um, PowerPoint. One second. Okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint again? Hopefully that's, yep, okay, great. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity that Catherine's provided and it's great to, um, to connect with international colleagues. Um, so recognizing that many of you probably have a longer experience in open education than I do, um, or more expertise, I really welcome the discussion and um, would love to hear from you. So either in the Q&A after this, or um, you're welcome to email me at any time, generan at creativecommons.org. And I know um, I share my, my Twitter handle later on, but I'll be honest, I'm at best a lurker on Twitter. So the best option is just my, my email address. Okay, so um, this licensed um, presentation is kind of um, nested, almost nested within um, the National Forum presentation that Catherine's made available. Um, I wanted to share this um, attribution statement right off the bat so you knew that all of the content that I share is openly licensed. It's there for you to use, to draw from, to remix with other resources that you might want to. We'll make it available after this presentation. And this is possible because um, this presentation is um, CC BY licensed. So this allows creators to give permissions to users um, to remix and, and use um, as they like, as long as they give attribution. So here's my attribution statement. This is within the, the National Forum presentation, which is also CC BY. Um, and we can get a little bit more into um, how these, these pieces of content can mix together later on in the presentation. Okay, so in this presentation, I will give you a quick overview of Creative Commons and how we got started. Um, I'll also just talk a little bit more broadly about um, some of the concepts of open education and OER. As Catherine mentioned, um, the term open can be a little bit um, confusing depending on the audiences and, and who's using that term. Um, and then we'll actually launch right into how to find and use OER and also how to create and share OER, which can be um, a little bit more complicated. I actually um, run a certificate course at Creative Commons for um, the last two bullet points. So we spend about 10 weeks delving into this in a little bit more depth. So please know if, um, if there's anything that I'm rushing through right now, it's only because we don't have 10 weeks together. But um, happy to share more information about the certificate course later if anyone's interested. All right. So what is Creative Commons? Creative Commons, as many of you likely know, um, but maybe some, some don't, is an organization that builds and stewards the legal tools, technologies, and programs that power open movements around the world. Um, you can learn more about us at creativecommons.org. Um, but in um, a little bit of our history, um, we were created in 2001 as kind of a response to a challenge folks mostly in the US were facing about copyright. So many of you know copyright is the area of law that regulates the way um, products of human creativity are used. So products of human creativity can be anything from a squiggle on a napkin someone writes down in a bar to um, an academic book um, or article, music, art, etc., songs. So copyright grants an exclusive set of rights to the creator. So the creator has the ability to prevent others from copying or adapting her work for a set amount of time. And that time varies by country. Um, copyright law was actually first created during the era of the printing press. So it's focused on regulating copy, on regulating who is allowed to, to copy and share with whom. Um, but um, 
we're obviously not in the era of the printing press anymore. So we're now in this much more information abundant, resource abundant era of the internet. Um, so while copyright places restrictions on, um, on sharing creations, the internet provides um, obviously plenty of opportunities to share, access, adapt resources, collaborate on, on creations, and, um, and access things at a, a much lower cost. So um, Creative Commons helps creators around the world um, share their works in a legal way with um, the terms that best suit them. Um, we provide the public domain tools and open licenses that have become the global standard for sharing. And um, so far, this is not a, a total estimate, a full estimate, but we have over 1.4 billion works that are open licensed on 9 million websites. And these works are used by different um, global movements in open education, in arts and culture, government, science, and more. <clears throat> and forgive me, I've got a little bit of a cold, so I might be taking sips of tea during our presentation. So let's just jump right into open education. Open education at its heart is about sharing. Um, this is a sometimes an umbrella term that can be used for the mix of educational resources, practices, policies, and communities that can ideally provide broad access to effective learning opportunities for everyone. The definition that I, I've liked in the past is open education is about using open resources to expand our collaborative, inclusive, accessible, and active learning, and our pedagogy. It's about giving more agency and opportunity to students and to teachers. So in terms of the umbrella term that um, captures our resources, practices, policies, and communities, I want to un unpack that just a little bit more. So we've got um, open educational resources, which we'll talk about in a minute. We've got open practices, which um, can include collaborative pedagogical practices, fostering interaction and peer learning, uh, knowledge creation and sharing, um, and empowerment of learners. They are um, a way for learners and teachers to, um, to develop new approaches to co-create knowledge. So it's, it's more of an empowerment of learners and teachers together, which I really like. Policies are formal regulations that, um, that focus on supporting um, these practices and the resources that fund them, that focus on adoption and use of OER and also practices. So we've got the resources, the practices, the policy, and then in terms of communities, I think of it as an open education global movement. There are a number of different communities, each with their own unique needs around the world that are contributing to this broader um, access to, um, to education. So um, just a few points about open education as a global movement. Um, I think there were a couple questions about some of this, so I wanted to spend a moment on this. Um, open as a term can get confusing. Um, open education is related but distinct from the other open movements. So um, there are open movements in um, scientific knowledge and research, that's open access. There's open data, which is um, focused on making um, research data freely available for anyone to use, download offline, analyze, reprocess, and so on. There's also open source, which refers to open source code. So the term open can um, be applied kind of at a, at a meta level to a number of different movements. But also I wanted to note that open um, can be a term that is um, used by different stakeholders or even um, used, um, I suppose, uh, misused in some ways. So people can apply open to platforms, resources, or practices that are actually closed or not easily accessible with the widest permissions available um, to reach the widest number of audiences available. Um, sometimes, um, at least here, we call that open washing where um, an individual or entity might use open because it resonates more with the audience that they're trying to reach um, and access, whether it's for commercial gain or otherwise, and even if the source isn't fully open that they're offering. So in a nutshell, open can get confusing, and I fully appreciate that. Um, in terms of the global education movement, we would have to go back um, many, many decades, probably over half a century, 
to, um, to look at some of the beginning steps. Um, there have been a lot of pivotal um, events that have shaped open education and the movement that we have today. But I did want to highlight one in particular, one, um, the Cape Town Declaration in particular, that I think summarizes the ideals of open education. Um, and this was a kind of foundational document that hundreds of learners and educators, governments, and um, educational institutions signed in 2007. So the Cape Town Declaration aims to create a world where each and every person on earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge, which is a, a pretty lofty goal. And um, I think something that really connects so many different communities in this movement um, together. So this goal is also supported by UNESCO. Um, UNESCO actually coined the term prior to the, um, the Cape Town Declaration, um, coined the term open educational resources in 2002 at a forum on the impact of open courseware for higher education. And since then, UNESCO has been a um, big advocate and promoter of OER. Um, and you'll notice if, um, if you follow the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals, implicit in Sustainable Development Goal number four is a need for open education and OER in higher education and beyond. Okay, so what are open educational resources? So we talked about the definitions of open practices, open policies, um, open education as a movement. Um, OER are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no limited restrictions. So I think it's important to kind of unpack that a little bit. Um, Oftentimes people think that OER have to be just online, but that is not the case. They can be intangible um, copies. So I actually, I should have made it available. I have a, an OER book that I, I often like to show people. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this definition is one that Creative Commons holds and also that UNESCO's um, recently updated and holds as well. So. Um, I bring this up because I, I recognize many of you may, may notice different definitions of OER online, depending where you're looking. Um, some funders have different um, definitions, and I think over the years, and as the open education movement has um, grown and developed, the definitions have um, also evolved. So um, there are a number of different debates on what should be included in the definition of OER. Um, we are aligned with UNESCO's definition. Um, and one other note on UNESCO, um, earlier this month, um, Cable Green and um, many others were working with UNESCO member states to um, get a UNESCO OER recommendation approved, and it was. So I expect this will be in its final stage in November, most likely. I think that's what he said. Um, but this, this OER recommendation builds government support for um, all the different facets that we need to further OER. So from capacity building and supportive policy, um, quality OER to sustainability to, uh, models to international cooperation and monitoring, this OER recommendation is um, a really uh, critical step in the evolution of this open education movement. Okay, and Creative Commons focuses mostly on the licenses um, and the licensing part of this definition. So um, while we have the, um, the global standard of licenses, I will, rec I will recognize that there are other open licenses around the world. Um, I would contend that the Creative Commons licenses are the, the global standard because they're interoperable. They work um, around the world and have um, the clear licensing language that lawyers around the world have worked on to um, to kind of unify. Okay, so another way to think about OER, um, which might make things a little bit um, easier, is by the permissions that they grant users. So when you have an openly licensed educational resource, that resource will allow users to make and retain their own copy of it. It'll allow resources to, or users, to use the the licensed resource in a wide range of ways. So hypothetically, if I gave you this PowerPoint, you'd be welcome to use it in a video that you create. 
although I'm not sure if you'd want to create another video, there will be a recording of this, which I hope will be openly licensed. Um, it, the um, OER also allow users to adapt, modify, and improve the, um, the content as well. So um, a lot of times you'll see um, Google Docs that have a Creative Commons license on them. As they are improved and updated, that is, um, that is possible without um, infringing on copyright because they're openly licensed. So it's, it's easy on Google Docs. It's also um, permissible. And then we've got um, the ability to remix. So openly licensed educational resources um, can be added together. And we'll get into this a little bit more in a minute. It can get a little bit complicated at times, but you're welcome to generally making sure that the permissions align, combine different resources together to create all new um, materials. And then you're also allowed to share or redistribute what you create with others. So it's not just sharing the original resource, but sharing the, the offshoot. And this is, um, this is kind of an important point. Um, not all of our, our licenses allow for OER. A couple of our licenses that include um, no derivatives clauses have, um, they restrict the ability to redistribute if you've made, made changes. So we have our CC BY ND or attribution no derivatives license and also the CC BY NC ND, which is the attribution non-commercial no derivatives license that are not OER. Okay, and then who uses OER? We, we came up with a, a list, it's not exhaustive, but um, it gives you an idea of the, the breadth and um, the scope of the public and cultural institutions that currently use OER. Um, I think we could break this down uh, much further, but for right now this is just to give you a sense, and I don't know if Catherine has any, any additional folks to add to this or any updates, but we wanted to give you a sense. I think this is a great kind of macro list, and, and, and what we'll do is maybe we'll, we'll dive down a little bit more deeply into the university sector after you're finished. Sounds great. Okay, so why is OER important? Um, this is an example of an, a piece of openly licensed, actually CC by CC0 content that we've added into the presentation. Um, so OER are important for a number of reasons. They improve affordability, which in turn helps students' success rates in learning. So particularly in the US, there are a number of studies that have demonstrated that improving student access to educational resources um, through OER improves their learning rates, which makes sense. Um, there are examples at the Open Ed Group publications and also the, <clears throat> excuse me, the UK Open Textbooks work. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> okay. OER are also um, much more accessible than traditional resources. So they allow um, people to better adapt the resources to meet learners' needs, whether those needs are um, based on a particular location that changes the cultural, environmental, or social cues. Um, they make them more available to and adaptable to learners with disabilities and their needs. Um, they also, um, because they're more easily shared across higher ed institutions, for example, and a little bit more flexible, they often lead to greater um, innovations and improvements. So one example I, I, like, to, um, I like to give is um, based on a US Department of Labor initiative, they created a repository for vocational training options that are all openly licensed. So this is skillscommons.org. Um, there you'll find a number of different syllabi and um, class resources on a range of different classes from all these different technical colleges in the US. Well, one organization in Mexico found this, found a, um, I believe a solar paneling, um, class that they, they really liked. So they downloaded it, translated it into Spanish, and then re-uploaded it to the Skills Commons page. So now even more people with more language needs have access to this, this content. So they not only made it adaptable to their own community, but then also enhanced the resource for everyone. 
Um, and then finally, OER are also scalable. So it costs much less to share resources with more people um, more quickly. The cost is nearly zero online. That's not to assume that there are not hidden costs for institutions that adopt um, an OER curriculum, but um, it is far more scalable than the traditional um, hard copy of books, for example. Um, and this is not to say that um, OER are a silver bullet or a solution to every challenge, but um, it's just to give you a sense of um, why we really are passionate about OER. And I can talk more about some of the challenges if anyone's interested um, probably later in the Q&A or afterward. Okay, so now let's move on to how to find and use OER. This is kind of the fun part. Um, you can find OER on a number of different repositories online. Um, I've highlighted a few here um, because we're seeing open education efforts at all levels of education, not just higher ed. We're seeing um, Z degrees at universities or zero textbook cost degrees. <clears throat> we're seeing the Global Digital Library, which offers openly licensed children's books in um, over 30 languages. We're seeing, um, and I have a number of US examples, but there are plenty of others, um, OpenStax um, providing um, full courses, syllabi, quizzes, assessments, videos, et cetera. Um, OER Commons is a wonderful repository for searching OER. Um, Skills Commons I just mentioned. Um, Merlot is another um, textbook repository. And you can always go to the OER world map to um, find out more about different OER initiatives, policies, et cetera. Um, you can search by country or by, by keyword. And then finally, we have the CC search functionality. Um, so I want to see if I can, let's see, share that, um, that website. Hopefully you guys are seeing the um, Creative Commons search page right now. You just go to ccsearch.creativecommons.org. And this is actually something that we've been building um, that started with images, but now we're moving on to OER. So what you do is you can search the commons for any, um, any kind of openly licensed image or resource that you want. We will be adding to this um, regularly, but I'll just give an example. I'll say, and I haven't tried this, so I don't know what's gonna come up, but I'll say penguin. Okay, and then you see a bunch of openly licensed images of penguins. Um, so these are just a few areas of where, a few um, sources online where you can search for OER. Um, in terms of how you use OER, it's actually simple once you find what you wanna use. Um, you share the content in the way that the creator permits based on the license, and then you keep the creator's license applied to your content. So you have to place the license on the content so future users also understand who made it and with what permissions. So we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute, but um, the acronym that we like to think of is TASL. It's T-A-S-L, Title, Author, Source, and License. That's what you want to include on um, works that you use and also your own work. <clears throat> okay, one more second. Okay, so how do you create and use your own OER? I'm not gonna spend all that much time delving into the, the particulars here because I know um, Catherine has a summary of the process in the National Forum Open Licensing Toolkit on the next slide. But really briefly, you can share, um, you can go to our, um, our chooser and actually walk through a number of different questions that um, will yield the recommended license for you. So I'll just show that really quickly. One second. Nope, not the penguins. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you are seeing the, um, the CC license chooser. You can just go to creativecommons.org slash choose or find out more in the toolkit. Um, and this, this is actually, um, this will be updated at some point, but it's a simple tool to walk you through a, just a very couple, a couple few questions that you need to answer. So you start at the top, license features that you want. You have to choose, um, whether you want adaptations of your work to be shared or not. So I'll say, no, I don't want adaptations to be shared. That'll change the license. Or yes, as long as other people share um, 
the adaptations um, they share alike. So um, they basically are applying the same license and using them in the same way. Um, actually, they don't have to use them in the same way. Um, then we look at allow commercial use of your of your work. So I'll say no, and that'll change the license, or I'll say yes. So then you scroll down to selected license, and based on my decisions, I would be um, best suited for an attribution share like 4.0 international license. These are the symbols or the icons that would um, kind of let users know what permissions you're allowing. But then you, all you have to do is copy and paste this text and that icon on your document or your, your resource to um, allow people to know. So we've got the, the icons, we've got the language, and also the link to the legal code. So if you have a website, then you also just copy the code down here and you can paste it on the back end of your website. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are, um, this is kind of a really quick and dirty overview of our license chooser. Again, we can get into more details on that, um, I think, with the next slide. But I will return to our slide now. Um, the, other, the other component of this is, um, well, they're, they're actually, a lot of nuances that we can get to in either the Creative Commons certificate course or in further discussions to kind of um, break down the in-depth um, use of OER, finding them, sharing them, and some of the um, some of the ethos around this this broader open movement and community. Um, so, if anyone's interested, um, I think I have this up. The Creative Commons certificate can be found here, certificates.creativecommons.org. Um, and I think that's all I'll say on um, finding and sharing OER for now. Um, if you want to use existing OER in your resource, things get a little bit more complicated. So I'll share a couple things to keep in mind, but um, please note that my guidance is not considered legal advice. I don't have um, a law degree, so it's technically not legal advice. <clears throat> so when you share um, unadapted um, versions of a work within your own, the content is considered um, collection content. So if you share two or more works that are openly licensed within your own work um, and you provide the attributions, that's considered a collection. If you <clears throat> If you adapt the content that you're using, um, then we consider that a remix or um, a derivative. Um, so that remix content or derivative content is still used within your own source. Um, <clears throat> and we still have to kind of give attribution the same as we would with, um, with collections. So basically we have one recommended practice, whether you use um, content in a collection or whether you remix the content. Um, so you, what you wanna do is, and I mentioned this before, is share the title, author, source, and license, tassel. Sorry, one second. <clears throat> so the other thing to consider when you are working with um, openly licensed work that you adapt is that you have to not only, um, you have to make sure that not only the work is um, compatible with your own licensed work, but it also allows for adaptations in the, in the first place. So what qualifies as an adaptation is actually um, complicated. It um, depends on a country's um, applicable law and that, that can range. Um, but we have a couple different resources on this front on this front to help. So we've got um, an adapters chart, which I can actually click and share. And then we've also got um, a, a chart, <clears throat> excuse me, for collection content. So this is under our frequently asked questions page. You can basically look at our chart and see. Sorry, I'll use my mouse so you can see because my finger is not showing up on the screen for some reason. <laughs> Um, you can look at the left side, or actually the top. You look at the left side, though, for the sake of this. 
um, and you select the openly licensed content that you'd like to add into your existing content. Let's say we use CC BY. Then you can see where there are green check marks. Um, that shows that it is compatible with content that um, you either put in the public domain or you license CC BY or you license CC BY share alike. Um, it is not compatible with non-commercial use by no derivatives or um, some of these other more restrictive licenses. Oops, sorry. It is non-commercial, but not with um, no derivatives. I was flipping down to buy an uh, SA. So what I like to do is just double check whenever I make a remix of content, I just double check that the content on the left matches up with a green check mark with the, the license I want to apply on the top right. Okay, and then for collection content, there's also a, a nifty chart. And this is similar. So this, this kind of shows the, um, the way to, um, to attribute your, um, your collection content and how you can use, use <clears throat> licensed content within your collections. Okay, um, we also have some additional resources that we've shared with Creative Commons certificates after, or certificate participants after a number of questions and challenges with, um, with this area of, of licensing. So um, if anyone's interested, I'll, I'll make all of these links available in the presentation um, after, after we wrap up. I'll just share the presentation. You're welcome to click through all of these links. Um, okay, I think I'll stop there because I feel like I've been talking a lot, um, but I'm happy to take any questions and I really appreciate your time and, and attention. I know a lot of this can um, get pretty complicated pretty quickly and um, forgive me for my, my raspy voice. It's pretty early here in the States and I think it's, it's uh, maybe allergies. Thank you so much, Jen. And yes, you're, you've been you. bravely talking through your froggy voice, but it's, it was all very clear. Um, I have a couple of other things back in our presentation, but I see a question from Julie that this might be the best time to answer that. Um, and she's written in the chat, could you just explain again the difference between collection and derivative content? Sure. So um, collections and derivatives are, um, it, they can be complicated. We've actually gotten guidance from our CC legal team to not, um, not make assumptions on what is exactly considered a derivative because the definition of um, adaptation uh, can change based on um, different countries' um, copyright laws. So at least in the US, um, a, a derivative piece of work is um, considered derivative if it has a certain amount of creativity to create it. Um, so it can't just be, you know, maybe changing the um, the aspect ratio of an image online it has to be it has to actually include more creativity of the the person um, making the derivative content i'm not sure if i'm making it as clear as i could a collection is basically unadapted work added into your open license content and you have to share two or more pieces of unadapted work and a derivative <clears throat> would be when you, you make changes that are um, considered original or creative and you add them into your work so you don't actually necessarily know where the original work stopped and your work began. Um, I think the, um, the analogy that we often like to use is um, this TV dinner versus smoothie analogy. <laughs> so um, you can think of all of the different food components in a TV dinner as almost like collection content within a broader collection. So you've got your potatoes and your, I don't know, <laughs> your carrots and whatever else that you have in your TV dinner in these individual separate compartments. You can see each of them. You would hypothetically, if this were a, a resource, you would um, add the license to each of them individually. <coughs> Excuse me. 
But for a derivative, that would be more comparable to a smoothie, where you have all of the same ingredients, but mixed together in such a creative way that you don't, you don't actually see where um, the original content ended and your content and creativity began. It's all kind of um, a, an original slurry. So that's one way to think of the difference between collections and derivatives. TV dinners, smoothies. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, can you see uh, this back to the slide again? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Uh, let me just get my camera on here. Okay, uh, I wanted to be sure and have some time for questions, but there's just a couple of things I wanted to, to say, just following what Jen Ren said. The, the detail of licensing is so important, but I don't, I want to make sure from our perspective that we don't lose sight of why we do this. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to straddle those two things here today in the webinar. So usually when you look at the definition of open education, it's, it says that you, the why behind op opening resources and practices is for three things. One is to increase the accessibility of those resources. A second is to increase the effectiveness of education. And the third one is to you know, reduce inequality um, in terms of um, education. So zooming right into you know, the, the one audience that's here today in the webinar who are recipients of Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund uh, funding and have been asked to make their resources open. It's very, you know, for those people, this is very straightforward. So we've recommended a CC BY license and from Jenwin's presentation, you can see why the most open license is the most, um, attractive because you can do the most things with it. So, you know, if you're working on a project and you make your resource available, that means anyone at any other institution in Ireland or globally, student or staff, um, can take that resource and adapt it to their own particular context. So adapt it to their particular program, their course, the needs of their particular students, the needs geographically where they are, you know, make case studies that are attuned to the learners um, in that particular community. So it opens up the potential for use of whatever resource you've created. So that gets at accessibility and effectiveness. And in terms of equity, um, one of the biggest arguments around um, open education is simply that, you know, many of us work in publicly funded institutions and, you know, our teaching and learning resources, sh those that can be, should be available publicly. Um, and this is a debate that's going on in many institutions now. But certainly, from the National Forum's point of view, all of our work and all of the work that we fund um, is made available under an open license. So for those people who, or those of you who would like to openly license your work, whether that's in connection with the Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund project or otherwise, um, the toolkit that we published last month um, goes through the steps that Jenrin just showed you on screen live. Like, how do you actually go in and choose your license? How do you do that attribution statement? Um, just the mechanics of it really um, are what a lot of people have difficulty with. And that's, there's kind of four steps um, in that toolkit that describe that. Um, and with that, I, my, I think I will just open up for questions. Um, I'm going to go to our document, um, maybe and just start with one of the questions that someone added to a document. And I might start out with a thorny one, which is who owns the learning materials that are created by lectures? Um, and I will invite others to join in the chat here. but. Um, the legal statement about who owns resources created by lecturers is in the intellectual property policy of your institution, and these vary actually across institutions. So most of those IP policies have been written um, with a mindset of protecting um, intellectual property that can be monetized, you know, and, and can make money. So this is kind of kind of pushing against what we're trying to do in open education. So many of the universities who are really at the forefront of open education have actually um, revised their intellectual property policies to explicitly state that um, they support open education licensing um, and teaching and learning resources should be made openly available. So um, for anyone who's here in the webinar, I advise you that's the first place to go is to, um, to look at the IP policy in your institution. And then I'd be happy to have a conversation with anyone in Ireland. And Jenrin, I don't know if you want to add anything or any of the librarians who are here um, in the webinar might add something. Yeah, I think um, as unless it's specified as um, in 
individuals' contracts at their institutions that they are work for hire, then um, whoever creates um, a lecture or other creative content owns the copyright. So um, institutions have their, their own IP um, rights and their own contracts with, um, with lecturers. So it, it'll depend on that, but look for work for hire in the contracts. Yes, and a couple of people have mentioned Lee, Allison, others that it's you know it's it'll be in your contract. So, um, the when you get funding though, if you get funding from you know from the EU or from the National Forum or whatever, you know that changes things again. So because the funders will have particular requirements for what you produce. So you know this is where the the notion of open gets complicated. But again, you know for individual questions that people have about this, I'm happy to have a conversation. But the best place to start is you know with your own institution's requirements. So, um, Lead, would you like to moderate any of the questions from the chat or from the document, perhaps, and, and share those? So, Jenrin, I think, uh, was clear about that, um, and I'm, I'm glad this was mentioned because and this gets back to, you know, the way we, we often use the word open and what it means in terms of licensing. So, for example, in a, a former round of teaching and learning enhancement fund projects um, here in, um, in Ireland, um, many of them were made freely available and that they had websites and they shared their resources. But when I went back and did an audit of, of the licensing, only a handful of them actually had Creative Commons licenses. So that means... You know, if someone stumbles across or someone shares um, one of those websites with someone and there is not a Creative Commons license on it, the person who finds that resource doesn't know if they can use it legally or not. And by copyright law, they would have to go back to the person who created it and say, hey, can I use this and how can I use it? So the Creative Commons license means that you're just putting something on top of copyright that travels with the resource um, so that whoever finds that resource knows exactly what they're allowed to do with the resource. So it really facilitates kind of frictionless sharing um, and, and reuse. And I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. Again, and there's an interesting point from Rob there that you can see. Oh, um, I can't hear Lee, but I saw some questions coming in. Can you, can you rewind and start that at the beginning? The mic's on now. Oh, sorry. Okay, excuse me. Uh, so yeah, just going back to uh, Rob's point on the chat, so I'm sure most of you have seen, but uh, most institutions, in relation to the IP, most institutions state something along the lines that in line with long-standing academic practice, that IP is vested in the academic for their academic work. But in Ireland, the Copyright and Related Rights Act is clear that IP created in work is owned by your employer. So academic practice in Ireland is a customary exception to them. Thank you, Rob. And um, the, this is where I think we can learn from um, other institutions who are modeling a different practice who, as I said, have gone in and revised their IP policy. So Rob, I would love to follow up that conversation with you because I think there's, uh, there, there's a possible opening there. So thanks for that. So then going back to the document, um, are there specific delivery platforms or hosting platforms that are more open than others? Okay, um, I'll, uh, I'll jump in there. And again, anyone else can, um, can join in. Um, many people in this webinar will, be, will remember the NDLR project in Ireland, which was a repository for open materials. And these existed in many other countries as well. Um, the US, the UK, and so on. And in recent years, uh, most institutions have moved away from this model of, of repositories and instead relied on open licenses and enabling people to put things in different places. So the University of Edinburgh, for example, which has um, a very well-known and widely um, copied um, open education policy, um, has some repositories that it uses, but it encourages um, academic staff to put things on YouTube, on Vimeo, um, on SlideShare, on whatever platforms they wish with an open license, and then they feature some of those examples. 
So we're, you're relying really on a kind of a network effect. Um, but the most important thing is the license. So again, um, the National Forum is, is trying to, to, um, to model good practice and, and to make things available and kind of you know, showcase open resources, but um, we can all work in our institutions um, towards, um, towards kind of creating those in our respective institutions as well. Um, on that, just going back up to the chat, uh, there's a question from Alison um, in, in relation to, to the projects. If the content is behind a username or password login, uh, such as the T-Rex website, or what, is that technically Sorry, can I ask a question again? Uh, so if the content, so this is going back, it's in the, the chat from Alison. If content is behind a username or password login, such mm -hmm. as the, the T-Rex website and project, is that technically not open? <laughs> no. <laughs> mm. And that's not technically open. I mean, it has to be unfettered access. Um, and I'll just add to that, in the Open Licensing Toolkit, we point out that some resources that are created by National Forum projects may, for various reasons, because of um, working with sensitive communities or, or, or other restrictions, it may not be able to, to be openly licensed. And we'd like to have a conversation about that. But the norm would be that we would like the default position to be that their Creative Commons licensed. And instead of asking, you know, why things should be open, why, why not open? Um, and if there's a good reason why they should not be open, then, then fine. But the default, we would like to be open. So the last one there, which I think you kind of covered, I don't know if you want to add anything on it. Uh, what exactly is meant by open, <laughs> particularly in terms of equity? Um, I think we we probably answered um, some of that earlier, but I I like the um, the most kind of inclusive definition of open possible. So you know, free and unfettered access to the for the broadest community possible and for the longest time possible. Mm -hmm. So if nobody has any, any other questions, I don't see anything else coming through there. Um, I wanted to add something and, and maybe give another minute if, in case anyone else had any questions because we, um, you know, we, we've spent a lot, a lot of time talking about the mechanics, but the, the whole reason why you might choose to use open educational resources, you know, covers a, a very broad spectrum. And that can include using, you know, open textbooks or sharing open resources with your students. Um, you know, remixing open resources so that they're more appropriate for the learning communities um, who you're working with. Um, but then there's also working with students to get students to create open resources. So, you know, working, there are examples of people who've worked on creating textbooks along with their students and then openly licensing those textbooks that are co-authored by the entire class. So, you know, and that gets to the point of of redesigning assessments so that students are designing things that are designed for authentic audiences. And open licensing enables you know, that kind of, um, of kind of creative um, teaching and learning and assessment. So things like um, editing existing Wikipedia articles, um, many academic staff are doing. So teaching students about Creative Commons licenses once we have gotten to grips with them can unlock a lot of possibilities in terms of teaching, learning, and assessment. Um, and the Open Licensing Toolkit is just going to be the first of a series of resources that the National Forum will produce um, to help support academic staff who want to do more work in that area. So this, is, this moves from kind of OER, Open Educational Resources, into OEP, or Open Educational Practices. And, and thanks to the comment coming in from Alison there. This is one of the, the, the most informative webinars I've attended remotely. Everyone should watch this to understand the basics of open. It's just it's, it's copyright. They're often used incorrectly and interchangeably with other words. So thank you both very, very much. Okay, um, you know, as someone who's worked in open education for a long time, I know this is, you know, just in, you know, probably an introduction and, you know, um, if it's good, Alison, probably it'll prompt more questions than we can answer here. So, you know, on our on our last slide, I think we have um, Jenren's um, email address and 
um, Twitter name, also mine. We'd be happy to field any other questions. And once again, uh, I leave the hashtags there. These conversations can continue via email, via Twitter, um, or in person. So we, we'd be more than happy to continue the discussion. And I, I just need to say a really warm thanks to Jenrin for, for your time uh, in preparing everything for today and for joining us today, despite your cold. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, and thank you everyone for giving up your time as well and just look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Excellent.